Hello, I'm Laura Lynn Tyler Thompson. Welcome to the 700 Club Canada. Today, we're continuing to look at ways that we can enrich our spiritual lives as we resolve to grow deeper in our walk with God. National speaker and teacher Lori Hartshorn is here to speak with Brian Warren about our fourth resolution how we can learn to give like God. You'll see that even your greatest trials can turn out to be a blessing for not only you, but someone else as well. Just like the story of Tawan McCarty, who got off to a rough start in life, but God has blessed her to finish well, and you'll see how he can do the same for you. You'll also meet the man behind one ministry that has been making an impact for over 30 years. But first, this is Brian and Lori Hartshorn and the beauty of giving. Thank you, Laura Lynn. You know, we have had all week with Lori Hartzer, and she has been sharing not only the depth of what she's gone through in her life, but she's also taking us deeper and beyond what she's gone through in the pain and going into the promise. So I'd like you to just welcome her once again. Lori, thank you. Thank you, Brian. You know, it's, I, I have just been enjoying listening to how God has worked not only in your marriage, but also with your children. Yes. And, uh, you know, one of the things I didn't hear, and I, and I was curious about, uh, when did you first come to the Lord, and how did He capture your heart? Well, I was a very young girl. You know, I was privileged to be raised in a home yeah. where parents had come to Jesus, and I was raised in a great church, and I had great teaching, yeah. and I fell in love with Jesus at a very young age. Yes. Um, you know, but through my own life, too, I would say in my teen years at, at, at a camp, experience yes. that he really met me there and I I knew my the calling that I mm. had on my life didn't know what it would look like um, but I knew that the Lord was calling me to to serve him and, and you know the call of God was on your and what, how old were you at that time I was 15 Wow yeah. beautiful yeah. and uh, what part of Canada was that well Ontario <laughs> mm -hmm. and a little town called Walkerton where the I know Walkerton. they're known for their water issues but you know I think the water <laughs> was safe bit. at the camp but yeah. anyway it was uh, it was a beautiful time in my life where I really had an awakening to the reality of Jesus in my life mm -hmm. yeah. and, and you know when you think about your early beginnings uh, it it was probably one of those that you you believed and loved Jesus but it was more that uh, from a missionary zeal that I, I want to share this love yes. with the world absolutely and I knew that I was somehow in my calling I was called to speak I didn't know what it would look like and you know you have to go back a few years, Brian, like, you know, I'm in my 50s, so this is 35 years ago, you know, and there wasn't a lot of women speakers or teachers or those yeah. that were speaking, uh, teaching God's Word. So it was hard for me to get around, what would it, what would it be like to be called by God? And I, I certainly knew I wanted to have a family and I wanted to raise my family to love the Lord. And, yes. and I just, I went into the field of education and I, I was teaching for 25 years and, and the Lord just opened up those doors in his own time, yes. but you know, I, I knew the calling was there, but it's up to him yes. to fulfill it and, and in the right season. You know, I, yeah. I, I wanted to know that because as we pivot, today we're talking about I Resolve to Give, and we've been focusing over the last week about how we will resolve not only to fixate on God, to think about God, to trust God, and then you shared about your children having prodigal children and how they, they were also uh, swept into, uh, if, if we would say, this this vortex of, of spiritual warfare. Absolutely. I mean, we, we understood the world and the flesh, but the devil himself, our three enemies, Scripture says, we were very naive. Yes. So when the teenage years started to happen and, and the kids were turning in different directions, you know, we really, we thought it was a battle of, we're certainly in a broken world, and, yeah. and, and that must be, you know, that was part of our problem. I prayed about the friends and the influence and all those things in the world, which was certainly part of the struggle and, mm. and is for our kids. And the flesh itself, you know, like my kids were just making bad choices, yeah. you know, they were um, their own nature, their own desires. Um, they were pursuing those things and allowing their own flesh to, to reign and mm. rule. And, but the devil himself, I have to admit, I, my husband and I would both say we were very naive yeah. to the reality of spiritual warfare. And therefore, you see, when you're naive to the, what's actually happening in the heavenly realms, and you're kind of, in a sense, limiting your view of things, 
right, to what you see with your eyes on earth, then you just don't pray as effectively. You don't live as effectively. You, you really aren't on the front lines. Yeah. You're in a battle, but you're not really getting it. So you're in a war, but you're not in the war. Yes. You're, you're in, and so, you know, I want to I jump into that because when we talk about giving ourselves away, um, the theology of suffering, what were you clinging on to when your children, and it seemed like the enemy had just a hold of your house? Yes, yes. Well, of course. Where was my, God in that? I, my theology, which I... I, I, sometimes you don't know what your theology is or what you really believe till you're in the fire. Sure. And my theology was tested and how I knew this is when we went to a counselor's office, my husband and I, which is a good place to be. <laughs> and, and I wrote down before, I have it in my journal, all the th questions I had and there were questions like, why God? Why yeah. me? I, I don't deserve this. <laughs> like, where do questions like that come from other yeah. than my theology was, if I'm a good follower of Jesus Christ and yeah. I'm obeying him and I'm living faithfully as calling, then, then what, somehow bad things don't happen to good people? Yeah. Did I really believe that? Well, clearly I must have because I was it questioning and doubting actually the goodness of God as to why we were even suffering the way we, I mean, this was supposed to be someone else's story, yeah. right? Yeah. So I, my theology of pain was tested and proven to be wrong in that I was realizing that I didn't want pain. I wanted pain removed. Yeah. You know, Lori, it's so important because I know as a pastor, I see a lot of people's theology is, is anchored on their feelings yes. and not on the facts of yes. what Christ did at the cross mm -hmm. and that we're saved by grace through yes. faith that no one should boast. But out of this, you were able to write something, Finding Freedom. It's, it's a guidebook mm -hmm. and it's also a Bible study. Mm -hmm. and, and you take people who are probably mm -hmm. naive, who don't know about spiritual warfare, but you open up their eyes to the reality of what's going on. Talk to us a little bit about that and, and how this, because we're talking about I resolve to give and God had something in you to give. Yes. And now that pain, it's, it's producing a lot of fruit. Yes. And you know, in our pain, we want to isolate ourselves. My first lesson is, you know, one of the enemy's tactics is he wants to keep us in isolation. Yeah. He doesn't want you telling your story. I mean, he doesn't want me sitting here sharing my story right. because this gives God glory, you mm. see. But when we isolate ourselves and we keep our stories to ourselves, a lot of that has to do with pride and fear. Yeah. And, and he actually wants us in that place. He doesn't want to share, you know, with others what's happening. He doesn't want us to invite others in. Mm. I teach that, you know, that one of the tactics of the enemy is isolation. Okay. He wants to keep you isolated from others, but the way you break that is you invite others into your pain. <sighs> And you, it, you invite them to participate in prayer with you. That takes humility. You know, it really takes humility. My husband and I were not excited about telling everybody how messed up our family yeah. was and the struggles we were having. Kind of like opening and yes. a lot of, a, a lot of intimate a wound, details absolutely. and everything. Absolutely. Yeah. But you know, we did find when we did invite others in that we weren't alone which is so often the case. You yeah. think you're the only family going through this. You yes. think you're the only one suffering yes. with whatever you're suffering with. Yes. And yet when you invite others in, it just demonstrates that we really are all in this struggle together and we can relate with one another. You know, scripture says that we, uh, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Yes. And though we walk in the flesh, we don't war according to the flesh. On the yes. contrary, the weapons of our warfare, are not carnal, but mighty in God. Yes. Uh, you know, Lori, someone's listening out there and they're mm -hmm. saying, my children are off the rails as well. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they don't realize that the greater the adversity, the greater the reward, yes. that God has something good on the other end of that. Yes. What do you tell them? Well, I tell them, yes, to trust God, that he does see the bigger picture. But I also say you got to get real about this. Right. You can't live in a, in a naive world that somehow this is, you know, your kids' choices are simply that and, and it's a bad world and they make bad choices. That we are in a battle on the front lines. The enemy is out to destroy our children. Mm -hmm. and, and he may not own our children. If they are owned by Jesus, All then right. we know Jesus owns them. But he wants access to them and, and any access he can get to the believer will disempower the believer and make them ineffective. Mm -hmm. And that's what he's out to do. He wants to, he wanted to take our family and with the calling that was on our kids that we s became more and more aware of and we yes. can see today yes. that he wanted to keep that hidden. He did not want to have that released, that he wanted to disempower yes. each one of us yes. and, and that by calling on Christ, he is our defender.
Could you do that for someone right now? Just Absolutely. Pray that? Lord Jesus, I ask you in your powerful name that you are the one who goes after our children, after our families, after our marriages. Lord Jesus, I ask you, would you go after your own? Would you go and seek and save those who are lost? Would you do the thing that only you can do? Would you cause people, cause those yeah, children God, to be it. drawn to you? Right now. Cause them to seek after you. Bring them to the end of themselves, Lord Jesus. May they cry out to you because you promise that you will set us free when we cry out to you. So Lord Jesus, go after the prodigal, comfort the parent, bring the parent to their knees, Lord Jesus, that you might get the glory, that you would go after what belongs to you and you would break the bondage of the enemy in the powerful name of the Lord Jesus. We ask this, amen. While you're a woman on a mission and on fire, Lori Hart. I want more families freed up. Amen. Right? I want Jesus' name all over our families. <laughs> you're yeah. doing it right now, thank you. You know, up next, a young girl runs away in search of a better life, but ends up on the streets. When Tawan McCarty was only three months old, her father was sent to prison. For me, that meant that love meant pain really early on. But I couldn't understand if he loved me and wanted me why he wasn't there. Tawan's view of God brought no comfort. God was hellfire and brimstone. You do this, you're going to hell. You do that, you're going to hell. I saw my father not emotionally there and or physically there. And I saw my heavenly father, he wasn't there either. When Tawan was 12 years old, a family friend sexually abused her. During the next three years, she ran away repeatedly and was in and out of foster care and group homes. I don't think I was running from anything. I think I was running to find something. I think there was so much missing in my life that there was a hole and I didn't have any clue what the hole was. At the age of 15, Tawan ran away for good. Within the first 48 hours, I can't pinpoint the exact time, is when I met my first pimp. I mean, he approached me and I mean, I had to take care of myself. I, mean, I needed to eat and he was really, really nice and very attractive man and said, I'll teach you how to take care of yourself. But he actually had four girls living with him. Within the first few weeks, Tawan's pimp taught her how to sell cocaine. But in a short time, his demands increased. And then it went to the dancing. There was a night he told me to go to the truck stop. And I had to come back with so much money. That was when it started. Because he told me I had to come back with more money than I had drugs. So I knew I had to do what I had to do to make the money if I wanted to go home. Tawan eventually became addicted to the drugs supplied by her pimp. I started brainwashing myself to cope. And I started reinforcing what they were telling me that it was my choice. And it, I was just a dope fiend and a whore and a prostitute and nothing else mattered. I never looked in my eyes. I just made sure physically that I looked the way I was supposed to look, the way I needed to look to do what I needed to do. Her pimp eventually began trafficking her all over the United States. I've been to every state but Alaska and Hawaii in a truck, and I've been to Canada and Mexico too. As a teenager, there, there was a group of us that they would take on circuits, and the biggest circuit that we went on was Atlanta, Birmingham, Nashville, Memphis, and Chattanooga. I remember going to the Kentucky Derby, but I never went into the Derby. I remember a table of pimps sitting down and talking about the Olympics, trafficking, pimping, prostitution, the whole industry is very, very organized. Over the next 10 years, the violence of the men she encountered left Tawan with emotional and physical scars. My throat has been cut, guns placed to my head, the trigger pulled. I have no clue how many times I've been raped. Now, I'm not talking about the paid rapes that happen every day. I'm talking about brutal rapes, rapes that you don't know if you'll live through or not. I have no clue. When she was arrested at the age of 26, Tawan finally saw a way out. After prison, she went through a 12-step program. Determined to overcome her past, Tawan eventually went on to earn a bachelor's degree and two master's degrees. Everything had to be perfect to prove that I wasn't 
the dope fiend and the whore and the prostitute. But there was still something missing. In 2009, she discovered the Birmingham Dream Center. Curiosity led her inside to ask about their programs. And there's this beautiful woman sitting behind this desk, and she's, I said, what do y'all do here? And she starts telling me about Bible studies and all this stuff, and I start gagging a little bit. And the last thing she says, oh, and I'm also trying to reach out to the prostitutes in the area. And this whole thing went off inside of me like, really, what are you doing? And she tells me, I'm like, oh, honey, no, it's all wrong. You're gonna, you're gonna get hurt. You can't do it that way. And she says, what do you mean? Do you know how to do it? And we start talking and she says, hold on a minute. She gets a notepad and we sit down and two hours later, she's taking all these notes. So at the end of it, she looks at me and she said, how do you know all this stuff? And before I could stop myself from saying it, I pointed out the windows that I used to walk the same street. Tawan started helping Lisa at the Dream Center with outreach on a regular basis. And what she did during that time was set an example. And she showed me what a Christian woman looked like and walked like and loved like. Because she showed unconditional love. And so I saw what Jesus really really looked like because of her. So this one day she calls me and this lady's in there. And I remember I prayed and all I prayed was, Lord, help me help her. I met Jesus. That moment I met Jesus, trying to help that girl. I didn't meet that man that they were talking about when I was little the hellfire and brimstone. I met Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the one who loves us, regardless of anything we've done. Tawan says her life was completely transformed after her prayer. I see a picture of me, and I go, who is that girl? There's a complete transformation and the love he shows me through others and the love he gives me every day. I have a daddy. I don't, he's not just a father, he's a daddy. Today, Tawan is using her past to bring hope to the future of others. She runs a Christian rescue home for girls trapped in the sex industry called The Well House. To date, The Well House has rescued over 100 women and Tawan continues to share her message with trafficked girls all over the globe. I am you. I have been there. I know who you are and what's going on inside of you. God rescues and he redeems and he restores. You are not alone and you are not unloved. My favorite line that Tawan said in the last story was she did not meet the God of hell, fire, and brimstone. She met Jesus who loved her unconditionally. You know, some of us, because of the way we grew up or somebody said something, you know, to you one time, God's gonna get you for that. We tend to see God as a really big disciplinarian and he is just waiting to pounce on us and he is angry and he's mad at us for everything that we've done. The truth is, is that sin wounds his heart because he loves us so much because sin leads to death and devastation. And the word of God in Romans 2 verse uh, 4 says that it's God's kindness that intends to lead us to repentance. It's his kindness. You know, when you begin to feel that God is calling you, it is not a harsh call. It is not a, a, a voice that, that yells at you and, and forces you to accept him. He is a gentleman and he is a father. And he asks you, will you receive my kindness? Will you receive my love? Because it is unconditional. My grace is enough. My mercy is everlasting. And every single morning when we wake up, the word of God says that his mercy is new every single day. Whatever happened yesterday, by this morning, his mercy was new to completely cover it. God calls to you in his kindness. It's a gentle voice. Will you heed? 
Amen, Laura Lynn. You know, seeing Jesus change lives today as he did over 2,000 years ago is the only reason that Laura Lynn and I are here. But this ministry doesn't exist without your partnership. Now, if you're watching these inspirational stories today and they're affecting you, then stand with us as we spread the message of Jesus Christ from coast to coast and help us make a difference in the lives of so many Canadians. You know, it's your generosity that allows God to reach into people's lives and inspire a nation of believers. As a thank you for your monthly gift, you'll receive this new DVD, Visions of the Night by Gordon Robertson, where you'll learn to identify dreams from God and their meaning. So call today, 1-855-759-0700. Absolutely. We appreciate your partnership. And, you know, we also would love to get something else into your hand. You know, if Tawan's story really touched your heart, this is overcoming guilt and overcoming shame as well. I believe that God has a plan for your life. Mm -hmm. Call the number on the screen, 1-855-759-0700. It costs you absolutely nothing. Prayer partners are standing by. Coming up next, behind the scenes on one of the greatest success stories in television history. Nobody but Jesus. For millions across the country, soul-stirring music like this fills their homes each Sunday on cable TV. And though it takes a small army to put the show together, the man behind its success is Bobby Jones, now in his 33rd year producing the program that bears his name. Even when I get ready to go into the studio, I just say, Lord, what a privilege it is that you use me to be a vehicle to bring so many people closer to you and to bring joy, love, peace, and happiness. Good news. Well, I that good news. Jones's show got its start from humble beginnings. From 30 minutes on a single Nashville station, it's grown into a network broadcast ministering to millions. Live that I ever think it was the first show produced for BET, my show. And we built this, this organization you know, gospel music. A former grade school teacher, Jones is now considered a musical trailblazer, earning a Grammy with country music star Barbara Mandrell and recognized by former President George W. Bush for revolutionizing the gospel music industry and exposing numerous gospel music artists to the world. Did that surprise you? Man, did it. That was one of my, you know, that was one of my high points. But beneath the fame and flashy suits are some of his lowest points. I began at a very early age protecting myself, you know, from the abuse, verbal, physical, and I, and I, and I was confronted with a lot of that. Jones tells CBN News he survived growing up in a home with an alcoholic dad. He says bitterness took hold as he watched his father mistreat his mom and siblings. He believes God's grace helped him eventually forgive his father, and now he's using his testimony to encourage others. So I just lived life. I went ahead to do the things that I thought that I could do to overcome that situation, and I just wanted to leave that total environment. And it's a lot of people who may be in position now that I was in then, uh, they'll just have to leave it or uh, find a way to get around it. And that's a part of life. His music and positive personality have earned him loyal fans. You came all the way in from New Jersey. Yes. Okay, yes. just to see the Bobby Jones gospel. This morning, yes. Because I'm a fan of his, and it was just my opportunity to come out, so I took it, and I'm here. Bobby Jones gospel has played a prominent part of BET's programming lineup since the network premiered back in 1980. Three decades later, his show is still going strong, contributing to the success of the network, and launching the careers of hundreds of gospel music recording artists. Dr. Jones' show has been the outlet for every major artist over the last almost 30 years. And uh, when I started in the group commission in 1990, um, my first national performance uh, from a television standpoint was on Bobby Jones' Gospel. For Grammy winner Erica Campbell, she always dreamed about one day singing on the show. When I think of Dr. Jones, I think of uh, being a little girl sitting in front of, the, in front of the TV on Sundays, waiting for an opportunity to just be on his show. Now she calls him a friend and appreciates his openness to showcase different styles like gospel jazz or rap. Most times you don't, you don't get that. If it's one show, you get one type of music, you get what the host likes, and that's about it. 
you know, but he's not that way. Singer James Fortune describes himself as a product of Bobby Jones's legacy and says the show is not about music, but ministry. He's selfless, that it's not all about him, that he's not just concerned about Dr. Bobby Jones making it, but he understands the kingdom principle is that we're all doing this together for the kingdom of God. And at 75, Jones says he has no plans of slowing down. You just did two shows. You're about to do your third. Yeah. Where do you get the energy? Well, you know, I do this for Jesus. Yeah, well, I stop, you know, I will when I have to. But if I don't have to, as long as the Lord's will, here I go. John Jessup, CBN News. Bye bye, y'all. See you next week. Washington. That's a cool story, Laura Lynn, because I remember Bobby Jones when I was growing up. And, uh, you know, he is truly a uh, trailblazer and a, a path leveler. Hmm. You know, it's neat to see how God works behind the scenes. Yeah. There's the story behind the story that you saw yeah. was how God was working mm -hmm. all the time. And you know, when you look at Bobby Jones' life, you recognize that it didn't start off peaches and cream. He had a lot of problems as well, and he had to be an abuse survivor. I was listening to uh, Marvin Sapp and also James Fortune and all those, those artists that were talking about how he was so generous and hospitable in his spirit, allowing others an opportunity and a, and a, and a chance. It was their place of early beginnings. But when you look at how he was an alcoholic father, and he said, I had to leave that behind. And he said, just leave the pain and leave those things behind. I wonder if that's you today, where you're saying, you know what, I'm in a, a terrible situation, and I don't know how to do that. Well, you're asking a great question. How do I do that? Listen to what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 9, 24. It says, do you not know that all those who run in a race, one receives the prize? Run in such a way to receive the prize. And I love what it says. Everyone who competes for the prize, in verse 25, is tempered in all things. Now, they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. You know, God has something so much better than what you're going through right now. And in 2014, I really believe what God is saying is it's not time for you to quit. Now it's time for you to just really stir yourself up. Call the number on the screen. If you need a little extra prayer, you need a little extra help and some encouragement, one 855 700 But I want to pray for you as well. Father, I join in agreement for, Lord, that invention. I join with that breakthrough. I, bro I join with that grow through. And we call it so now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, we need to remember that uh, that sometimes when it is darkest, it's because God is about to break forth the dawn. So true. You don't quit. I love when you say that. You don't quit in the pit. That's right. Right, Brian? Well, you know what? It's, it's because when you look at the dreamer Joseph, that mm -hmm. Joseph had such a call on his life mm -hmm. that he was called to the palace. God never gave him a picture of the pit. Right. He only showed him the palace. Yeah. So I believe he's got great things for you today as well. Well, we sure do look forward to being with you all again. Until next time, I'm Laurel and Tyler Thompson. And I'm Brian Warren. Have a great day, Canada. God bless. To contact us, phone 1-855-759-0700 or by email cba at 700club.ca.